Welcome, welcome all of you to our webinar on energy management at the Wallace Collection. Uh, I always like to begin with a quick trailer, the, uh, the bit when you go to the cinema and they tell you about future presentations. So the next few webinars we've got after today's a really useful, really practical one on housekeeping and quick wins for saving energy. Uh, for churches and then into the new year in January we've got a session on solar panels on churches, we've got a session on electric car charging and then a second a repeat of the housekeeping and quick wins. That one's deliberately at 6pm because we know that the daytime ones include somebody, some people and exclude others so we're also running them at six o'clock so that that will suit people who are in work all day and can't make a daytime webinar. All of the details are on our website. Joe, maybe I can ask you to find the link to the webinars and pop it in the chat. Uh, in terms of our Zoom etiquette, aren't we all used to this now? Uh, please do keep your microphones muted to avoid interruptions and cameras off, we find tends to work best. If you've got questions, please do pop them in the chat and we'll come to those at the end when Jürgen has finished speaking. I'm recording this talk when I post it onto the website. I'll have edited off the beginning bit and the and the questions bit at the end, so it'll just be the talk. And after today, if this is all right with you, uh, Jürgen, I'll send the slides around to everyone and um, so that you uh, can can use them for reference later. So. Um, Introductions. So there's myself and Joe on the webinar today who are the, the staff team behind the Church of England Environment Programme. I am uh, the bricks and mortar person and Joe is the hearts and minds person and I am in the National Cathedral and Church Buildings Division and Joe is in Mission and Public Affairs. And then our speaker today, Jürgen Huber, is the Senior Furniture Conservator at the Wallace Collection. He is a member of one of our national conservation committees and he's also converted his own home to being a nearly zero energy building and he's going to tell us today what we can learn from the Wallace Collection who've done a lot to try and cut their use of energy in the context of having an incredibly important, nationally important, I bet you would tell me internationally important actually, a uh, collection of artefacts. So finding that balance between looking after the artefacts but while still cutting their energy use. If I stop sharing now and hand over to you to share your slides and get going. Let's see if this works. I can see them, that is perfect. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much for having me on this series. Uh, it's an absolute privilege and I hope I can help you all a little bit further and obviously you've got my email address at the end. So any more questions, please come back and ask either via Catherine or, or directly to me. Um, so just quickly about the Wallace Collection, you're up here, you, I'm, I'm up here in the Furniture Conservation Studio on the third floor at the Wallace Collection. So if you can see my cursor here, it's right at the very top here. And that's what you see if you come to Manchester Square, if you come to Bond Street and you walk a bit north, that's what you see. That's Hartford House, Wallace Collection. And it's it's possibly or arguably the biggest bequest ever given to a nation in terms of number of the value of art objects. So not the number, but the value of these art objects. So it's it's not a, a quantity, but the quality what you find here at the Wallace Collection. It's mainly French, 18th century art. We got everything from or the Louis, basically, uh, and through the 19th century. Uh, the house was converted to what you see here. So when you come to Manchester Square, you see the Wallace Collection. That's what you see. It's just been renovated. It looks absolutely stunning. And I'm going to go into a few more details about that. But just to say, uh, it was converted to what you see today in 1872, between 1872 and 1875. And it's they've done everything to the book. I mean, these were fantastic Victorian architects. They basically knew it would house an amazing collection of artworks or furniture. In particular, it's very fragile and, uh, you know, paintings, yes, 
they're often a bit overrated to my mind, but you have so much decorative art, which is much more friable than, for example, an oil painting, uh, if you don't talk about a panel painting. So what you have here is like you have thick walls, you have a passive ventilation, you have uh, the whole, uh, all the galleries are cluttered out from the inside with cedar wood, which is obviously pest repellent. So you have uh, high uh, room, rooms and a uh, lot of airspace. And so it really was built to house this collection. I've done a fantastic job. It all went a bit wrong uh, in the uh, early or, or late 20th century. Uh, first of all, um, when they converted it into a museum and they basically blocked off chimneys, blocked off fireplaces and installed the central heating system when it was converted into a museum. And then uh, next was they tried to actually install an air conditioning or they have, we have got an air conditioning installed, they didn't try it, but they tried to make it perfect, which is basically impossible in an old house, you know, that it's just really, uh, it, it always would end up in compromise. But before I go to further on that, I just want to show you how my talk is, uh, is uh, scheduled. It's uh, we talk about Hartford House a little bit more. Then I talk about the energy reduction practice and other solutions. So I really going to hit it straight hard. And then later on, I'm going to talk about why we have to save energy. And again, that may feel to a lot of you it's it's old news, but I just really think it's so important to talk about it in that context. And obviously, um, at the end, we have questions. Now, just back to Hartford House. Any, any old building, any historic building works best when it is properly maintained. And with main maintenance, I really mean it's a whole lot. What we have uh, a problem here, for example, at the top, we have gutters there can be blocked with leaves. So if you come to Manchester Square, you see we have a lot of trees, very leafy trees, uh, which even though that, that Hartford House is quite high, these leaves come fly over and they're blocks of gutters and they literally have to be cleaned every week in the autumn time. Um, it's, I went once there with uh, the then head of uh, facilities and actually had a look on how that works. It's quite a bit of work to actually make sure that they're non-blocked and that uh, even if you have um, little krills and mesh around these, these downpipes that they're not blocked either. And the maintenance is just such an important part and to actually look at that paint doesn't seep, uh, sorry, water doesn't seep behind paint and, uh, and that you use the most appropriate materials in your restoration or in, when you renovate a church. And I put in this slide here, which is basically the chimney, which is literally out here, if I would turn the computer screen around, you would see exactly that's what you see on your screen here. It's outside the third floor conservation studio. And, uh, and that was all uh, covered, that is a, is a brick chimney, which was covered with cement based mortar, which caused huge damage to the brick because water seeped behind it, it didn't breathe. And they bit literally with now with the renovation here, they had to uh, support that chimney, uh, take all that water away, a lot had to reface some of the bricks and used actually now lime mortar, so hydraulic lime uh, as a proper repair to actually fix that permanently. And again, when I spoke to uh, all the people here involved in the renovation of, of that, that's nearly like one million pound job, all of that, the whole facade has just been redone. So when you now come to Manchester Square, you haven't seen the wall. If you've been to the Wallace Collection before or Hartford House, it, it never looked that great. It's fantastic. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. The pointing done fantastically well and all the original, all the traditional materials, the right material, not necessarily, traditional doesn't necessarily mean right materials, but all the right materials have been used. And so it looks at its best because you have to bear in mind a damp wall is a very bad insulator. So before we actually consider solar panels, before we consider insulation, double glazing or whatsoever, uh, maintenance is top priority and using the most appropriate materials for any repair work and that has to be addressed first. Now what we've done here is sort of, I, I said that is what we've done first. Second best thing is basically go to LED. Now early LED had a very bad reputation and you have to always think of your mobile phone or your computer laptop, the mobile devices, how quick that evolution has come from something quite chunky to actually something really small and smart. 
LED has gone through the same kind of evolution. It's fantastic. We went very early on with the filament LED, you can see here, which really have a fantastic color rendering. And I put in that slide, you can see a few um, spectra I put in. And again, with the cursor, I can show you one is a compact fluorescent light bulb. We have an incandescent light bulb here. We got LEDs, a filament LED, and we got daylight or sunlight. And it shows you, obviously, incandescent has got a very little light, so to say, and a lot of heat. And it's literally with an incandescent, we have 90% converted into heat and 10% into light, whereas modern LEDs are much better. They're literally, it's the other way around. It's 10% heat and 90% light. And the spectra is fantastic, much better than, for example, the compact fluorescent light tubes. And yeah, and we obviously gradually phased them out. We haven't gone along and just basically replaced all compact fluorescent light tubes, all incandescent light uh, light bulbs. We just basically replace them as these break down and with with more modern uh, filament technology uh, lights. And obviously, they have been tested with UV and and other uh, and, and infrared light, so they're they're perfect for our art object. But one has to bear in mind all light is damaging. It's not just UV light. It's all light, the whole light spectrum, and it's an accumulative effect. Now here, when you come to the Wallace collection, to you go to the 16th century gallery, we got these island cases here in the middle. And these island cases, they had uh, very light sensitive materials here. You have either waxes or manuscript cuttings. And so you have to actually lift the leather top on here and you press a button and you get for one minute a light and again, what, what we did here is uh, that was only done some 10 years ago. And that is like a halogen fiber optic light box. So basically you have all these fiber optics running out of that light source. But when you press that button and the light goes on for one minute for to light up your objects, what actually happened, it's an aperture opens for just one minute. The light doesn't come on for a minute. The light bulb stays on continuously. That's a hundred watt halogen light which runs continuously during the opening time. And only when you press the button, the aperture opens up for one minute and you see your, your uh, uh, manuscripts or waxes illuminated, and then the light turns off again. And that was only done 10 years ago. And it's not just the heat, not just the energy we waste with these 100 watts per each of these cases. And each case got about three or four of these light boxes. So that is a waste of energy, but also you have to take that heat out of the Wallace collection again. So the air conditioning is working overtime to actually cool it down because we have more problem in, in summer in, in summer heat than actually in the winter when it's cold. And that's also in terms of relative humidity, we have more problem in the summer because we have to cool the galleries because they get incredibly hot because all the visitors come in, every visitor has about a hundred watt on heat. So to take that heat away is more of an issue than actually in the winter having it just a bit colder. So just to bear this in mind, uh, so you, you pay twice, you pay A for the waste of energy for these halogen light bulbs and you waste energy by actually trying to get that heat off. So we replace them with much smaller, much smarter LED light boxes, which are then barely connected to the, to the um, uh, fiber optics. So that's very nice, very, very easy, but again, uh, it doesn't work nearly as well as what we've done in, in another occasion, which I'll show you the next slide, because uh, LEDs just don't like heat. And if you have a very powerful center LED light, you, you, you're wasting a lot of energy in terms of LED. You, you haven't got that efficiency. What you want is a lot of small LED lights to actually give you the same effect than what you would get with one massive one, but uh, you have less less power usage. So here you go. We have other display cases, which we all converted into LED. So these are shot cases, but uh, shot lights, but there are many other, other manufacturers. And they're basically, instead of using 100 watts, they use 20 watt. And uh, so it's still quite powerful, but, but that is the only way we could do that in this, in this way. But we have, you know, what I'm saying, you have to investigate if you have to light up some area, uh, just make sure you, you get the best light source for that. Uh, purpose. Here we got our old light because we have a lot of these display cases. They're old. They're, they're, you know, they come with, with the Wallace collections, so to say they're over 100 years old. And obviously money talks and you can't just buy whatever you 
fancy. So here in this case, uh, we actually, these are, these are fluorescent tube lit at the top. You've got like, these fluorescent tubes and uh, give a horrendous light, but that's just how it is. So we actually turned these light source up, off. And what we did, we bought these LED strip lights. You literally get them on a roll. I don't know if you see that at the top corner underneath the Wallace collection. You literally buy a strip and here you go again with the strip light. And we basically put that strip light on a nice wooden molding in front of a shelf and and literally had a nice wash of light everywhere rather than having the top lit cases. Yes, these are all on glass shelves, as you can see, but the light coming through from the very top, passing all these objects, obviously the very bottom shelves are badly lit. So that's again something which I'm very keen on to share because that these are very easy, they're very cheap. And you just barely put these LED strip lights wherever you fancy, and it's very easy to do. Our, our in-house in electrician did that. We had, or, or I had the idea, and then um, uh, I spoke to the electrician and said, "Well, yes, we can do that." And, and everyone was happy. We measured the light again, um, and it's all all fine in terms of the quality of the light. Uh, here again, you got this in a bit bigger, so you barely have a photograph. If I go back to that slide, it, it's what we're looking at. This this display case here on the right. And the next slide shows you these strip lights, and you can see basically these 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 lights just been attached to wooden molding. You can barely see it, giving a nice wash of light uh, for something if you want to lit up light up something um, very nicely without much effort. Uh, here we got something which we done again in in trying to get off our air conditioning system to so to reduce the load of our air conditioning system because obviously that comes with a huge energy bill and with a huge carbon footprint subsequently by saying that we did have a renewable only supplier for a while but yeah that's a different story uh, here for example what we did on site is literally uh, we had display case here in this case is our venetian glass which needs exactly 40 percent relative humidity all the way along um, and rather than actually getting the whole room to that environment we just made a display case uh, safe and that this display case really works on 40% relative humidity. And that was relatively easily done. Again, something you can maybe apply on, on your building or church to actually say, well, if, if something needs really a tight parameter, a tight parameter of relative humidity or temperature, you can actually make a micro environment and actually do that, that these cases are not totally sealed but that buffers the outside environment quite nicely. And within that case, we have what is called a Han unit, class by Han humidity control module, which actually regulates humidity uh, all the time. So it doesn't regulate the temperature, but the temperature in this case doesn't really matter so much. And obviously the temperature is reg regulated within the galleries within a certain band. And just to say that that certain band be aiming for 50% relative humidity. At, um, at 20 degrees centigrade all year round, but it's very, very difficult to achieve that. I mean, be absolutely assured uh, you would have huge maintenance costs and, and on top of the energy bills are enormous. So taking these things out of the general environment and basically making sure that they have the right environment within these display cases, uh, with relative little effort, that is what we achieved here. We did that before with fume silica. So again, that's an old display case. We knew there were always very tight parameters, but we always had to change the fume silica. It was very time consuming and not nearly as accurate as this unit. We had one of these units now 10 years ago and it broke after 10 years. So unit is 10, uh, 4,000 pounds. So over 10 years, it's basically, it's 400 pounds a year cost with, with I mean, tiniest amount of electricity we, we need and basically no maintenance because any humidity the system takes out of that display case it basically keeps it in a tank and then humidifies if there is a, a demand so it's very uh, easy very low maintenance now we go to something a bit bigger we had in our furniture studio here and we have a photographic studio up here on the third floor and also a main conservation workshop and we used to be fed by the main air conditioning system and that was very problematic because we were so to say the last in the food chain and when the main when there was a huge demand for for the collection we were always the last one and we would get the warmest water in the in the summer when we need to cool it and the coldest water in the winter when we need to heat it 
And so it, it took me a few years to convince my, my then boss to say, look, could we not get just a small air conditioning system or also known as air to air source heat pumps. And that's what we did. And so we had uh, now these installed. That is my very first one, which is literally running now above me uh, it, as we speak. And uh, it's fantastic. That cost 6,000 pound in 2010. Uh, a lot of money for saving a bit of electricity bill, basically. <clears throat> but these costs have declined so tremendously. And uh, you get now compact ones for 800 pounds. You, you just need to drill a hole in a wall. I mean, they're just, the, the, these things are so fast evolving. You know, you, you, you check three years ago, check it again. It's just amazing. And also there's so many more companies installing them. Um, which again makes makes installation costs much cheaper. So the unit themselves have reduced in cost, but also uh, the cost of installation and maintenance is basically next to nothing. Um, and then we have the next one, 2019, we had some uh, units installed and they are, got a, quite a funny name. They're called Daikin. I mean, that is a, a well-known aircon manufacturer, but the units are called Yorugu Sarara. Don't ask me why, but they also bring in fresh air. And you can humidify with the water of the condenser unit outside. And that is completely new. So you basically, with your air conditioning, you can actually control literally your humidity in terms of dehumidify, humidify, and you can uh, supply fresh air on demand. Um, they're fantastic. And very, that was, you know, we got two big units installed for just 5,000 pounds, just to put this in context, you know, within, within nine years, uh, half the cost, um, in fact, uh, a quarter of it, because we got two units for that money. Um, and uh, and it's amazing. They're, they're really, really good. And that's what we're using here. And basically just the way their function is, like literally, if you look at, at, at your fridge freezer, obviously it produces uh, always, uh, it freezes, keeps your, food cold and what you've got on the outside is a small compressor and often you had on the back of your fridge freezer a grill which basically uses up all that heat yeah from the outside air and basically um, cools that down and you have a cooling inside your fridge freezer and air conditioning or air to air source heat pumps are working exactly the same except that you can switch it and you can actually cool in the summer and you can heat in the winter with the same very same unit it's, it's very energy efficient. You only need about 200 watts to actually get one kilowatt of heat out. So you put 200 watts of electricity in and you get about one kilowatt of heat out of it. That's a ratio of one to five. Others are one to four. It depends also on outside conditions. Generally speaking in, in England, uh, I just don't understand why there are not more air to air source heat pumps used because they're just fantastic, uh, low maintenance. And yeah, they, they've got a few disadvantages, but yeah, uh, another time. Here, uh, next step we did, we installed our, our own uh, solar panels. That's like, you can barely see these panels. I literally had to go onto the, on a particular floor, which you can't see from uh, when you come here as a visitor. To actually take this picture so you can actually see our eight solar panels. I mean, obviously, I would have loved to have this whole roof filled up with solar panels, but, but it's always a cost implication. And you also have to convince people. And it's, it's, it's very tricky um, to do, but we got them. They're produced now so far, we only got them a year and a half, and they're produced so far 7,255 kilowatt hours. Is it a lot? Is it a little? Well, it helps. Uh, when do they repay for themselves and what is the embodied energy? And these are things which, which you always hear when, when people argue about solar panels or having air to air source heat pumps or electric heating. So, how long, does it, does, uh, how long do you have to wait to get it paid back? Or how long does it, do you have to wait to get some money back from your gas boiler or your, or your oil heating or paraffin heating, whatever other heating there is? You know, if you apply the same critical thinking to all other technologies, yeah, please do so, because then you, you, you see that, that PV solar, air to air source heat pumps, saving energy, LED, uh, is a win-win situation. The embodied energy of a solar panel is recuperated within a few, few months, yeah, if it's obviously installed facing south, east or west roof, you know, if you put these solar panels in your garage, they will never produce the embodied energy. It's like, you know, it's, it's an argument which I see again and again. I mean, your bicycle has embodied energy 
it will never recuperate that embodied energy. It only saves your energy if you use it install instead of your, your car, for example. So it's a lot of arguing about against solar panels. I mean, I made that suggestion in 2014. Uh, a very important person said to me, well, uh, actually, uh, you know, that is very immature technology. Uh, we wouldn't like to have that on here. And uh, I just, you know, what can you say? What can you say? It's, it's a very immature technology and it works very well. And uh, it works better every year. The, the efficiency has gone up and up and the cost has gone down. So something to consider, seriously consider. That brings me to, to fake news. I put that slide in because there's one an attempt to clone Jesus underway. Uh, there are sort of effects on wind turbine on earth rotation. And you wouldn't believe this is like a Wyoming Institute of Technology. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic website. They're giving all sorts of fantastic news. But interestingly, often these news will make it to real policy. And that was the case here in America, because in America, you hold your town in America, in the US, rejected solar panels because uh, they would suck out the energy from the sun, because that was also one of the articles, solar panels strain the sun's energy experts say. And it's interesting, if you don't fight these, these misinformation right from the beginning, you really end up with, with quite some amazing news. If you don't really address these immediately and say, look, you know, let's have you consider it X, Y, Z. Is it really true? Um, just here a bit about my own house. I mean, here you can just sort of, I, 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 covered, I covered in the slide a little bit my, my, myself here. That is my home in, in central London. It's a mid-terrace house. I've got 16 square meter of solar panel. Now, is that a little, is that a lot? Well, it is enough to get me near to energy neutral or nearly to zero carbon. Um, so basically I uh, buy off the good, I got no gas connection. I, I, I disconnected the gas meter, or not, not me personally, I had the gas meter disconnected uh, because I went pure electric. I went with a renewable uh, only energy supplier. And I basically uh, produce 50 solar panels around 3000 kilowatt hours a year. And I use, as a, with a family of four, uh, we use 4000 kilowatt hours a year. So we, we barely import or I buy 4000 kilowatt hours a year but I actually uh, produce 3,000. So it's a net, net, I only use up 1,000 kilowatt hours with a family of four, uh, everything done electrically. Um, so we got here electric underfloor heating. I got an air-to-air -air source heat pump. I got an uh, induction cooker here. And I just barely showed that, you know, the induction cooker is like only on an induction cooker, you can actually cook with putting your uh, uh, towels or, uh, uh, um, uh, thing around and in, insulate that 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 pan without risking catching fire. And I barely put here my my stainless steel double walled cafetiere next to it. And I'm just hoping that in some stage someone produces pots and pans which are actually insulated on the side, so you actually uh, can cook more energy efficient. So I do everything as energy efficient as you possibly can to reduce my my usage. And uh, the house on my family were featured here in the Guardian, then basically in the in the Telegraph, and in the Times a few years earlier. And it's like on the Super Home network, on the Super Home database, you can actually find my home. And yeah, so I basically put that all online the information, so you can actually see instantly what sort of uh, insulation I did, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as I said before, uh, I did insulate the house, but the insulation is not terrific. It's it's not a passive house standard by anyone means but with the pv solar it allows me to nearly get get energy energy neutral so to say um uh, also here again it's a boat i'm it's it's going a bit off off here but basically uh it's another boat i had built we used to live on canals and again this this boat i built in 2010 i just want to tell you about the cost of it uh in 2010 i had this boat built in bromsgrove near near birmingham and these are solar panels, by the way. There are solar panels here on the roof and on the side because I want to take advantage of that boat. It's a, it's a cruising houseboat, but it's facing actually, this side is facing south. So I want to harvest the energy reflected from the water. And it worked fantastically well that these, these three solar panels, actually three solar panels here, produce as much electricity as, as uh, the other nine on top of, of the boat. Just to give you an idea, the orientation of solar panels is incredibly important, obviously. Um, but here you could see that 
that was 25 square meter of solar panels producing me 1.6 kilowatt peak power. Yeah, so that is a peak power of 1.6 for 25 square meter solar panels, and that cost me 10,000 pounds. Yeah, only two years later, I put 16 square meter of solar panel on my roof in my house and or our house and uh, or bank's house, so to say. Um, and these 16 square meters had producing me more than twice as much as these 25 square meters produced me. And I just want to tell you that in terms of evolution. And I got the solar panels with an inverter, everything singing, dancing, fully installed for 12,000 pounds. I paid 12,000 pounds in 2012. Whereas on Bauhaus that Boda had built, the inverter cost me 8,000 pounds. The solar panels cost me 10,000 pounds and I had to install it myself. So I had not even half of that what I have on my house just a couple of years earlier. That is how that evolution has gone. It's, it's incredible. And obviously here I got a picture of the Lynch motor that that whole boat is powered by a motor. You would just laugh. It's tiny, that motor is absolutely small and it's incredibly energy efficient. It converts over 90% of its electricity of, of energy into, into movement, 95% if it's, op, it's optimum, it is best, but not all the time. Um, and that is basically completely reversed when you think of, of a car, a car, a conventional car, just like a very pretty radiator on wheels because you've got 60%, 65% of your energy goes out through heat. Yeah, and only 35, if you're lucky, a little bit more goes into motion. So electric motors are really the answer because you have so much more energy efficiency. But yeah, just nearby. Here, I just put the pictures and I looked on, 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 online uh, to find some uh, pictures of, of churches in particular, where you have different techniques uh, shown here. Here you've got like a chandelier, which actually got infrared radiated heaters, in infrared heaters here uh, attached to chandelier. Because obviously, if you have underflow heating, if you would go, for example, and you uh, uh, put underflow heating under all these pews here, uh, in a church that is jolly good and you get a bit of heat, but you will be absolutely freezing around your head. Uh, make no mistake. And, and maybe combination of the two is better here. You get again, infrared heaters, infrared heater. So it's it's quite common. I mean, obviously you see every second pub has now infrared heat or even gas heater outside, but infrared really directs the heat where you need it. And I think that we really have to move away from radiators and gas you know, gas powered heating system or oil heating system. But obviously we have to do this gradually, sensibly, uh, you know, you can't just go along and, and do that. And I just want to give you um, th that thought provoking slide. It's not like uh, um, I got the answer to these questions, but, but every church, every building has their own uh, challenges. And, and one mustn't think just of the church as, as one building. You, there are outbuildings, uh, garages, Vicarage where you can have um, solar panels installed and, and start somewhere small rather than just thinking of something too big. And here, yeah, just the last few slides are going to be very quick. I promise we have answers, a question and answer session. I just really want to bring it home. I want to bring the that all into context, why we actually have to save energy. It's such an old hat. I mean, people talk about saving energy. It's like, you know, it's nothing really happens. And it's just so important. And you have to remember that the first Earth Day was 1970. I mean, it, that's 50 years ago. The CO2 emission have gone up tremendously. I mean, you know, you look here, that's the years, 800,000 years ago. It's never been that high. We have a real problem. And then also there's an economical question because the, the bills here got here that from the Sunday Times uh, in, in 2014. The average annual gas and electricity bill has increased almost threefold since 2004. So within 10 years, uh, it's gone nearly threefold from 472 pounds to 1,263 pounds in average. And, and energy price, there's no only one way to go. They, they, they're gonna go up. So one has to bear in mind that. So we have to reduce our consumption, that is our biggest, biggest thing, what we have to do, we have to get down to reduce our consumption. I have to church a bit colder, but talk to people about it or whatever. It, it really has to be brought home. It's so important to save energy because any form of energy generation has disadvantages. And that's what, again, I want to show you in the next few slides, why I am so um, 
vocal about that. And again, going back in time, you know, we have a headline, not sorry, not a headline, it was a newspaper article, a relatively small newspaper article in 1912. In 1912, talking about the problems, the effects may be considerable in a few centuries. I mean, that is like came out in, 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 in 1912 uh, about the CO2 emissions, yeah. We have here Jimmy Carter addressing the nation 1977 and saying, if we do not act quickly, I mean, that was 1977. We got here Michael Thatcher in 1989 addressing you, the UN first talking about climate change and that it is a real emergency. And again, why Michael Thatcher probably didn't do much about it, but she set, set the scene that all of a sudden climate change was in everyone's mouth because if she talked about it, that it can't just be uh, uh, some fantasies. There has to be some, something real, uh, tangible. And in this sense, we be or a gratitude because she really brought it into the front line, climate change, and and companies really started to invest into solar development. And uh, big companies, big corporations, really did uh, put a lot of money aside to do that. And that space is a consequence of what, what's happening at the moment. These are just a few headlines from the last couple of years, how urgent that is. You know, I mean, here you see this parish church down there, and I think that's nothing shows it better than this, this church. It's like, I mean, you can clean your gutters as much as you like. You can maintain that church as, as super. But, you know, you have that is that is your problem. You're not going to have many people coming by boat. You know, you, you, it, it's it's that is terrible. And at these these weather extremes happen more and more frequently you know these century events happen every few decades and the decade event happen every few years you know obviously venice that also made the headline it's a real problem we have a real problem and there's also the human cost of all of that it has to understand uh, the heat wave in india so many people uh, made committed suicide there's about sixty thousand suicides of Indian farmers are linked to climate change. They're, they're credible studies. There's not some fake news, not something really abstract. It's really happening in the world. We have, we have all of these uh, migrants, refugees, whatever you want to call them. Myself, I'm a migrant. Um, well, why do they move from A to B? And and why well, I, I certainly wasn't affected by climate change, but but everyone got their their own. Uh, part in it and, and their own part to play in it. And it's just really important. I mean, anyone watches Al Gore, Unconvenient Truth in 2006, uh, he will recognize all of these headlines because in 2006, uh, Al Gore pretty much predicted all of the things which happen now, including Corona. So it's, it's quite extraordinary how long we know that and still do very little about it. And it's not about, uh, I don't think there are too many humans on, on, on earth, as many people always argue, is simply distribution problem. And here, if you look at the countries with the largest cumulative CO2 emission since 1750, well, you know, you don't find India at the very top. So just to, to explain that, uh, I'm not going to raise along because I, I'm running out of time, but I just want to show that if you, if you don't like to waste energy, if you don't want to... Uh, <laughs> have energy produced in any sort of, of way, we have to save energy because if we produce energy, for example, here with lignite, uh, that is what, what happened. I mean, these, these towns get raised down to the ground in Germany. It's, it's something terribly underreported. It's really, really sad. 300 villages have been destroyed in the last 90 years. 300 villages have simply been, people have been re rehoused. We're talking about thousands of people. Now, if you don't want to have that to happen, well, save energy. That's why we have to save energy because they're, they're just they, these, these they are ginormous holes in the ground. They they reshape the landscape. The landscape being reshaped through lignite um, uh, um, extraction is the size of everything which fits into the M25 around London. That is obviously in three main areas in Germany. But, but that is a landscape change uh, forever. That is just, that's true. And all you have is a lot, of, a lot of CO2 on top of that, apart from all of this digging around. So it's not, it's not nice and it undermines the German energy, the German energy transition tremendously. Um, well, if you don't like lignite, what, what about hard coal? Again, you come to the lovely area of Salo Lux Falls. It's down here where I put that arrow, that's where I come from. I'm very used to, to uh, uh, this sort of coal mining down there. A lot of my 
people people in the village were coal miners or either either coal miners or diamond cutters, one of the two. And uh, and you have here like a, a most advanced power station, which is basically called chimneyless power station because you in theory do not need a chimney because all the sulfur, all the um, uh, amazing toxic air is washed fantastically well. So out of this chimney comes only CO2. So it's it's pretty clean. So to say, and obviously these are the cooling towers. And, and there's a river Saar is nearby, you know, and that's it's right on the French border, uh, uh, um, right on the border to France. And here you've got Folkling, which is like a, a Welt Kultur Erbe or Welt Heritage site. If you're interested in, in industrial heritage, have a look there. It's absolutely amazing. It's, yes, it's a fantastic coal power station, very advanced, very great, and won many prizes. But look at this massive mountain behind here. That is all the slug and ashes being washed out of the system. They are basically stored there for God knows how long because they actually try to put them back into the mining shaft and then realize that it mixes with groundwater and the groundwater basically falls into the mining shaft. The water seeps down to the bottom and then it barely seeps all up and then it barely um, pollutes all the water around there. And they have enormous pumps, enormous problems to actually try to clean that up. On top of it, uh, when it gets really hot, the river Saar hasn't got enough water to cool for the cooling towers. So when it comes summer, yeah, coal powered station like this one and others along the Rhine, as well as nuclear power stations in France actually shut down because it's literally, you boil water, you drive a turbine and that's it. It's very primitive and not very energy efficient and you need water. And uh, if there's water too hot in the summer, because we had an exceptional hot summer, or you haven't got enough water, these power stations have to be turned down. Now, as I just mentioned, if you don't like any of the coal power stations and our, our energy is based on fossil fuel, um, you go nuclear. Well, nuclear got many other disadvantages. And the main thing is there has been no last resting place of any nuclear waste anywhere in the world. So there has been not one successful decommissioning of any nuclear power station anywhere in the world. You have to bear this in mind. Yes, pieces have been dismantled, but the nuclear waste is always stored temporarily somewhere around. And we in Germany, we had Gorleben, we had Asse, we had quite a few uh, uh, mistakes, which they all have to sort of tick that all up again. It's quite something. And the biggest thing is, is basically, uh, it got a government indemnity insurance. So every solar farm, every wind turbine has to be insured. I have to pay extra premium on my uh, solar panels on, on my roof because they could fly off and damage something. But, well, the, uh, uh, operator of nuclear power plant, they only have to pay the first few millions, maybe the first couple of billions, but that is nothing when you look at the Deepwater Horizon accident from BP, which costs them 60 billions at the very least. So just put this in context, and that's in a massive subsidies to which we give nuclear just for free. And I do think a lot of it is, is, is really, really science mixed with wishful thinking well, known as science fiction. That's why I got the USS Enterprise here, because of course you can buy these magazines that tell you all about what, what's happening, but these things don't exist. They're just, they're fictionist. And it's a great idea. And the best nuclear power uh, we have at the moment is a fantastic, I'm totally into nuclear fusion. It's the sun. The sun is the best nuclear fusion reactor we have, and it's fortunately far enough away, so we can't temper with it. And that's really important to, to realize. So if we want to have, a nice earth preserve for our children, grandchildren, or for someone else's children, so to speak. Well, you know, we have to save energy because the energy production is not very pretty. And uh, yeah, one thing I just want to mention here, you look at the first rank here, the first uh, uh, row, you see a company here, retail company, which makes seven or let's call it six billion pound profit, whenever that was, I think 2019 and employed 2.2 million people. Yeah, so 2.2 million people created enough income to, uh, or generate enough income to make six, to produce six billion pound profit, yeah. Um, is it good, is it bad? Each of these employees have to, have to actually pay taxes and so on and so forth. Now, if you go to row number six, you have a company which made, oh, 110 billion pound profit in the same year, oh, with only 76,000 people. That is an oil, oil and gas company, the other one is a retail company. And that is what we're looking at at the moment when, when people don't understand why we 
why we are what we are and how did we how did it get so far it's literally you have uh, fossil and nuclear has an energy density which is unrivaled with renewables so you have got you have got very few people can generate enormous income because of the energy density and you we don't have that with wind or solar, but that would be an advantage for us because if you want to create employment, if you want to create a just transition or energy democracy, that is what has to happen. We have to basically share that income with many more people. And it actually it could work to our advantage rather than a disadvantage. You don't just make a few rich, but, but many. And that's just the last uh, couple of slides here. Heat wave forces in France to shut down nuclear reactor. That was last summer and the summer before it was the same. Uh, France is a net import of electricity of Germany because uh, in summer particularly we have a lot of PV solar uh, electricity and we actually got so much electricity we have to send it away. Uh, a few sort of tools if you want to look if you if you're interested in something like that British Energy Electricity Life is uh, MyGrid GB. If you check this out it's fantastic it shows you exactly what energy where the energy comes from at what time is live data so within a few hours delayed obviously. You got here an amazing graph showing you what the electricity mix was in 2012. And just within eight years, you can see here, in, here green is here nuclear. And here black is coal, how much the coal has gone down, how much wind is red, and how much solar has increased. So England has done a tremendous energy transition much faster at a much lower cost than, for example, Germany. And uh, it's it's amazing to see that. and and. Uh, it's a lot to be proud of, uh, a lot of big work needs to be done and could be done quite easily, but it's it's not, not a bad start. And here, just to show you here this graph to show you uh, how uh, solar complements the day usage. So basically the red line, when you look at this graph here on the left, at the bottom, you see that sort of mountain, uh, sort of Rocky Mountain landscape. You have uh, the red is a demand curve. And here's basically where the energy comes from. And solar complements fantastically well um, uh, wind and other sources. And that's basically just investment. Again, how the investment has gone down in Germany, while the share of, of uh, renewables in Germany has gone up tremendously. It just pushed a huge wedge in here. And everything above the yellow line is exported because Germany has to export huge amount of electricity because we don't know what to do with it. And so, here you go and again a graph here you can see so cost of electricity here's a light blue line hardly ever goes above the five uh, uh five pence per kilowatt hour that's a retail uh, on the market on the electricity market hardly ever more than five pence per kilowatt hours and often it goes to minus 20 i mean sorry minus minus two pence sorry uh, per kilowatt hour because we have to pay austria to take our electricity and if you have too much electricity, if the sun does shine and the wind does blow, well, it turns into hydrogen. You can make hydrogen steel. You can make here a house uh, completely off the grid in Germany. It's a company, HPS, which does that. You basically store your own hydrogen and you convert your hydrogen via fuel cell into electricity and you power everything with electricity. And that's basically your, your house completely. You can store the liquid air and a money out of time. And basically that's uh, uh, to infinity and beyond because I really like to see church commitment to go uh, to uh, carbon neutral by 2030. National Trust was always well ahead of everyone else. National Trust done some tremendous work on there. And you have over 200 councils committing to carbon neutral. You have companies and so on. So it can be done. We, 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 I'm, I'm you know, very confident. And now uh, that's the last slide of Richard Wallace. I just want to bring him in because he uh, gave away the Wallace Fountains in Paris. Yeah, clean water to, to people that are still called today the Wallace Fountains. We got one actually in front of, of our of, 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 of Hartford House. And it's barely sharing water. Uh, what would he do today? Would he invest in, in solar? Would he, would he actually give, give free electricity? Would he give away free electricity? And that would be something to be considered if people come and, and get maybe free electricity when they park at certain times. And, like to thank you all very much and it, i know it's been a race and and a lot of these slides have been thought provoking but you know i just want to get bring in the context over to you catherine i think thank you <laughs>